Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Bauer. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And today we're going to talk about thyroid hormone replacement. And what I hope to do today, first I'll tell you my disclosures. I do provide consulting, although I don't think it's going to impact this talk for two different companies that make thyroid hormone medications. Um, but here's what we're going to try to do in the next 30-ish minutes or so. Um, kind of talk about hypothyroidism and what is it and what are the differences between central and peripheral very briefly. And then we're going to go through the kind of the history of thyroid hormone replacement just to bring home the point that what we're doing today, um, we're beginning to question if it works for everybody. Um, and that has to do with, you know, levothyroxine or Synthroid as T4 monotherapy. Um, and how did we get there? And was that always the way we did thyroid hormone replacement? And what are we thinking about maybe some patients, you know, what and why some patients may not benefit just from monotherapy, might benefit from combined therapy. Along the way, I had a task of trying to connect this to um, hypothalamic obesity. So I will try to do that as well. So there's a little bit of thyroid, there's a little bit of hypothalamic obesity, and then more thyroid. And then at the end, I try to connect the two together. Um, and at the end, one of those connections is, you know, what should we be doing or could we be doing to think about if and how to incorporate thyroid hormone into prospective trials, uh, not as an individual therapy, but as obviously multimodal therapy for patients that have developed hypothalamic obesity. So here's the um, just simple but super important feedback loop that's the thyroid hormone system. So the whole endocrine, which is beautifully designed this way is a feedback system. So for the thyroid, the, there's a place in the brain, the pituitary, and the pituitary is actually controlled by the hypothalamus. And from that area, that pituitary gland sends signals to different parts of the endocrine system to make a hormone, and then it measures that hormone, and then it alters the signal. So for the thyroid hormone, the signal is thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, and the thyroid gland produces T4 and T3. So the difference between T4 and T3 is one has four iodines attached to it and one has three. So if these go down, that's hypothyroidism. The pituitary gland, if it's working, senses that and sends more signal and the TSH goes up. So the hypothyroidism describes the T3, T4. Hyperthyroidism, which would describe these numbers being elevated, in that case, these go up and the TSH goes down. That's if the system's intact, and that would be peripheral hypothyroidism. So the thyroid doesn't work, T3, T4 go down, pituitary wants more, senses they're low, TSH goes up. In central hypothyroidism, that means that the pituitary or hypothalamus or both are not capable of responding to T3, T4, and that they can't produce adequate or can't produce at all thyroid stimulating hormone. So for patients with central hypothyroidism, we look at the T3 and T4, actually most people only look at the T4, um, to determine if we're adequately replacing um, the thyroid with, as I described, levothyroxine monotherapy. So the table at the bottom of this graph just shows those things, the so central versus primary. I mentioned T3, but in clinical practice, unfortunately, many people are not following T3, and I think that's unfortunate and really an important thing that endocrinologists should be following. So in central, TSH is not adequate. We use T4 to alter medication replacement. People should be adding T3 as well. In primary, thyroid doesn't work. T4 is low. T3 happens to be low also, and then TSH goes up. When you also look at the blood tests that are available, there's a free and a total T3 and T4 that are available. And all that's describing are just two different pools in our blood system, in our bloodstream. So 99% of thyroid hormone, and in fact, other endocrine hormones too, are bound to a protein. And if the test is measuring that, that's a total T4, a total T3. So it's measuring the hormone and it's measuring the binding protein. When we measure a free T4, an FT4, we're measuring the unbound, the free form of the thyroid hormone. In general, there are people that believe that the free T4 assay is better than the total T4 assay and vice versa. Um, and that has to be discussed with your endocrinologist because everyone has their own um, likes and dislikes for certain assays. When we think about hypothyroidism patients with CNS tumors, the majority of patients will have central, and that's either because of tissue invasion or from the surgery or from the radiotherapy.
um, used to treat whatever residual tumor is left. So it can be central, but there are some patients that actually develop peripheral. So they had surgery for a CNS tumor, then they had radiotherapy. The head and neck was part of the, the field of the radiotherapy, and the radiation actually damaged the thyroid gland, even though the pituitary is intact. So it's still possible to get peripheral hypothyroidism in patients with CNS tumors, or you can get combined. So what you end up getting has to do with where the tumor was located, what the tumor size was, what was used to help get rid of the tumor, which is surgery. And then if, you, if the patient goes on medical therapy, and medical therapy, I mentioned one, radiotherapy. So that's listed here, radioiodine-based. Um, oh, this is actually radioiodine-based, that's for thyroid disease. But radiation, external beam radiation obviously impacts that. And then there are a bunch of different chemotherapeutic agents we use now. Many of these are actually oral that can also impact uh, thyroid function. And that's just a table for reference. Well, how about obesity? Just to introduce the hypothalamic obesity. So for patients that have CNS tumors, and the most common one that's associated with hypothalamic obesity is a craniopharyngioma, a tumor that's located within the cella or just above the cella, uh, originating from the cell outside of the cella. So before surgery, many patients present with this long list, as you can see in table one, and in that list is obesity. So up to 20% of patients, even before any therapy, will have evidence that the tumor is somehow damaging the hypothalamic area and potentially um, then having that lead to obesity associated with hypothalamic dysfunction. What happens after surgery, of course, is that 20% increases in some people and some studies even up to 80%. But at least half, if not 50% of patients, depending on how big the tumor was, how extensive the surgical reception, if they had external beam radiotherapy, 50 to 70% of patients will develop hypothalamic obesity. The etiology is still a matter of discussion and not complete consensus, but what people think is that there's increased appetite, um, secondary loss of leptin action, so peripheral leptin is, is higher than it should be despite being in a well-fed state with extra calories. And there's studies supporting that and refuting that. And then there's altered day-night sleep cycles, there's decreased physical activity. And then, as I mentioned before, um, the percentage has to do with how big the tumor was and how much surgery was required in medical therapy to help decrease tumor size and hopefully achieve uh, remission. What you will notice, though, is hypothyroidism, even though it gets blamed a lot in the public area, um, is not part of the cause of hypothalamic obesity. But one of the questions is if hypothalamic obesity is a consequence, is, is hypothyroidism or, or thyroid dysfunction a consequence of hypothalamic obesity? So we don't think hypothyroidism increases the likelihood of gaining weight, gaining, you know, in, in not using calories adequately, um, but there may be a, a role between the two, between thyroid uh, status because of the hypothalamus and the pituitary producing TSH, which I'll show you later in the talk. So let's go back to hypothyroidism and just say, well, where have we gone? Where are we? And why are there now differences in discussion within the endocrine field for something that's been pretty well established as far as monotherapy since the 70s? So well before our time in the 1800s, before patients had, the, before science had the ability of making thyroid hormone, there were people dying of hypothyroidism. They developed myxedema, they would have heart failure. And so in the 1880s, 1890s, a group of physicians realized that you could transplant animal thyroid into a patient and they would transplant it under the skin, over the shin in the lower part of the leg. You could salvage patients, they would survive, but it might take six or seven transplants because these things eventually stop um, producing thyroid hormone. If you take a thyroid from an animal, and that at the time was sheep, but they've also used um, cows and they've also used pigs, what you're using is all the thyroid hormone that's in the thyroid tissue. And it turns out that it's not just T4, which is levothyroxine synthroid, but it's also T3. So the thyroid makes more T4 than T3, but T4 is a pro-hormone. At the cell level, T3 is the one that's more active. So when you used transplanted tissue, when you use desiccated tissue, because that's what happened after transplanting, they figured out how to dry animal thyroid tissue converted into IV forms and ultimately into a pill. And that's what Armour is, West Thyroid, Nature Thyroid. It's desiccated animal thyroid. You're not just giving T4, you're giving T3 and T4. In the 1950s, synthetic sodium salts of T3 and T4 were produced. 
And by the 1960s and 70s, that's when we started using combined desiccated levothyroxine. And it turned out during that time, four out of five patients actually were on desiccated thyroid hormone. And I'll have a table later on to show you the different companies that produce it in the United States. But early on, we were using combined therapy, whether it was transplanted tissue desic or desiccated tissue. In the 1960s and 70s, um, Braverman out of, out of Boston discovered that the diiodinases. So diiodinases are enzymes that convert T4 to T3. So in our body, if you give someone T4, they can produce T3. So they can diiodinate, they can take away an iodine. The reverse is not true. So our bodies do not have the ability to take T3 and make T4. And there's really no reason for that because as I described, T3 is the, is the active hormone, T4 is the pro-hormone. So these diiodinases are type one, type two, and type three. And you can just see from this, this picture what the structures are, the chemical structures of T4 and T3 are. But what we're mostly talking about are type one and type two diiodinases, and they're expressed differently in different tissues in the body, but it's the conversion of T4 to T3. So that was one thing that led from desiccated to how we got to using T4 monotherapy because they discovered that our bodies will convert T4 to T3. The other thing that was discovered in the early 70s was the ability to measure TSH. So prior to that, we could measure T3, we could measure T4, but we couldn't measure TSH. And what people realized is that the majority of patients were over-treated. So previously, previous to having these lab tests, patients may have been on 200 to 500 micrograms per day. And once these tests were able to be used in clinical practice, people realized the TSH was low and maybe were over-treating patients. And we've now reduced that to try to allow the TSH to be normal. We also realize that desiccated thyroid doesn't have the same ratio as far as what the tissue contains compared to what our thyroid tissue contains. So animal thyroid has way more T3 than T4. A human produces about 15 to 20 as far as a T4 to T3 ratio for every one. And pigs is, is four to five um, T4 to T3, their ratio. So there's much more T3 in an animal thyroid than there is in a human thyroid. And then in the 60s, what happened is the FDA decided we need, they needed to get involved and start to try increasing the quality of, of um, the medications that were being used in clinical practice. And what happened within the land of thyroid is the FDA defined the differences between what the dose difference can be between a label. So if you have a thyroid hormone that's labeled 100 micrograms, between manufacturers, it could be up to 12% difference. But within the same manufacturer, that 100 microgram tablet could only be 5% different between batches of producing that thyroid hormone. And that's really the only difference between generic and brand name. So when you talk to your endocrinologist and they're saying we should be on brand and we should be on generic, the only difference is if you're on brand name, then you decrease the chance that you're getting a different dose. It doesn't mean that there is gonna be a 5% difference, it just means that it could be. So if you're on Synthroid and you're on 100 micrograms, it's always plus or minus five. If you're on generic, there's five different manufacturers in the States. So if you're on generic A of 100 micrograms versus, and then next time you pick up your prescription, you're on generic B, that instead of a 5% difference could end up being a double that, 12% 12, 12 difference. And it doesn't mean it is, but that may explain why patients on generic, some patients don't have the same stability of their thyroid hormone levels because the amount that's within each labeled amount per pill could be maybe different. The issue with desiccated is, and why some endocrinologists still to this day are a little bit hesitant in using it, one of it is, is the FDA kind of defined this bioequivalence for drugs that were produced after 1938 and desiccated was produced before 1938. So it's not as regulated as some of the other synthetic forms of thyroid hormone. So in the 1970s to 2000s, we moved away from desiccated and we moved into thyroid hormone monotherapy. So LT4 is levothyroxine. That's what um, Synthroid is. And that became our first line. And why that is, is because T3 has a very short half-life and T4 has a very long half-life. So the half-life for levothyroxine is five to seven days. T3 is in hours. It's highly safe because when you take a pill and you take it consistently after four to six weeks, you establish a therapeutic range and you pretty much stay within that range. There's very little peaks and valleys because of the long half-life. And then there was predictable manufacturing because it was synthetically produced. So there was a change from the desiccated you know, 
combined therapy, T4, T3 to, T, to T4 only. And so dosing became age and weight based, and there's many tables on this. The average adult is on about 1.6 micrograms per kilo per day. And the younger your, the patient is, the higher the micrograms per kilo per day. These are of course then altered based on what the TSH is and, and other factors that endocrinologists use to try to pick the appropriate dose. The schedule is once daily. If you miss a dose, you can double up. They've even looked in adults. If you miss seven doses, you could take all seven on Sunday, none the rest of the week. Of course, if you do that and you forget Sunday, then you've forgotten the whole week. But it's a very stable medication. You can take it in the morning. That's what most people recommend. But you can actually take it at night if your mornings are chaotic or your kids are more chaotic in the morning. 30 to 60 minutes before eating, although in reality, 15 to 20 is usually adequate. And then you avoid taking it with supplemental calcium, iron, and soy. What we usually monitor is the TSH at minimum. And then, as I said earlier on, TSH and T4, whether it's a total T4 with a T3 resin uptake or free T4 are the most common lab tests we use to monitor if you're on adequate thyroid hormone replacement. And the goal is to normalize the TSH. So you want to give enough T4 to make the T4 normal, the T3 normal if you measure it, and the TSH normal. So with one pill once a day, you should be able to replace the thyroid if it's not working or if it was removed or if there's not a signal from the pituitary hypothalamus to the thyroid to tell the thyroid to work. But as you can imagine, not everyone does well on levothyroxine. And that's what we're starting to realize now, mostly you know, since the 2010s, but really in the last five years, it's becoming a bigger and bigger point of discussion in the land of um, endocrinologists and especially thyroidologists, people in endocrine that are really only studying thyroid disease. So if you go on T4-only therapy to normalize the TSH, it turns out your metabolism, your basal metabolic rate, how much, how well you use energy is only 10% 10 compa 10 compared to controls. So on T4 only, normal TSH, you targeted exactly what you wanted to do. You still don't have the same metabolism. Your metabolism is still more pro-calorie gaining than it is pro-calorie uh, as far as calorie using. So it may not be the greatest um, as far as basal metabolic rate, which would be important if you have an increased risk because of hypothalamic obesity. And 10 to 15% of patients just don't feel satisfied. If you question them, if you perform surveys before they had a need for thyroid hormone and after, up to 15% of patients are unhappy. They feel like their thyroid hormone is not adequately replacing their thyroid prior to the dysfunction or the surgery that led to the hypothyroidism. So they have residual signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, even with a normal TSH. But the problem, as you can see here, is that the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism are not specific. So there's a number of things that are just everyday life. Who's not tired? Who doesn't have to watch their weight? Who doesn't have dry hair, dry skin? Who doesn't have sometimes constipation, irregular hair, heavy periods? Those things could be thyroid related or they could just be life or it could be a combination. And so it's a very difficult situation for the patient because they know they don't feel right. And the endocrinologist says, as your TSH is normal, it shouldn't be your thyroid. But the reality is it still could be. Um, and so it's a very hard place to figure out. And then you throw in all the stresses, especially in the last year and a half, um, that it just gets very complicated just to rely on signs and symptoms. And so what other things can cause signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, even mood disorder, decreased mood? Well, if you have a chronic disease, such as, or you were treated for a malignancy, especially a CNS malignancy, just that treatment alone, especially if you had radiotherapy, can alter your cognition, alter your ability to perform physically, um, you get more fatigued. And so there's lots of things that are not thyroid related that put patients at risk for having some of those signs and symptoms. And then of course, there are thyroid related things. And these are the ones that your endocrinologist should at least be open to talking about. So are you on the right dose of T4? Are you absorbing your T4? Are you, are you metabolizing your T4? And now another discussion that should be had is T4 only, T4 monotherapy adequate to make you or your patient, your, your son or your daughter, or your family member feel better. And there are some patients that feel better on combined therapy. And if you put that into the context of what we know from adult studies, if you put a patient on T4 and you actually target that their T4 is going to be in the upper end of the normal range, 
with at least 7% in this one study looking at over 5,000 patients, that you have enough levothyroxine that you're pushing their T4 to the upper end, if not over the normal range, 15% of patients won't even have a normal T3 within that. So as I said, you can deiodinate, you can convert T4 to T3, but there's at least 15% of patients who don't adequately deiodinate, irrespective of giving them more levothyroxine than you otherwise should have to, as reflected by a high T4 and even a low TSH. So there are some patients that don't efficiently deiodinate. And if you look again, this is just a different study now from Jackie Johnquist from Washington Hospital Center and looking at just the ratio pre-surgery, this was the T4 to T3 ratio, after surgery showing that the T4 is not adequately replaced and there's a higher ratio. So again, another study in addition to that one with 5,000 and it begs the question, were we better off prior to going to T4 monotherapy for some patients? I think many patients do well, but some patients may benefit from combined. So why don't people adequately convert? Well, there's at least some data now to say that there can be some genetic alterations in one of these enzymes, and they're called single nucleotide polymorphisms, where there's a genetic change. So the enzyme still works, it just doesn't work as efficiently. It doesn't efficiently convert T4 to T3 as if you didn't have this SNP that you can see labeled there with all those letters and numbers. So if you have one of these genetic polymorphisms, which is testable on a research basis, you may not adequately convert T4 to T3, and you would then identify someone who would clearly benefit from, or at least have an increased likelihood of benefiting from combined therapy. So how do we connect this to the hypothalamus? Well, the top part of this is just the text version of what I mentioned earlier. So the most common tumor is a craniopharyngioma, 20% have hypothalamic obesity or at least obesity prior to treatment, and that increases up to 50, 60%, if not 70% post-treatment. And it's multifactorial. So it's not going to be one pill gets rid of this, one treatment get, you know, helps treat hypothalamic obesity. It's physical activity, altered circadian rhythm, rhythms, question of this leptin resistance, but then the question of thyroid and how could thyroid play a factor? Well, it's in the hypothalamus where we're really looking at not just what does TRH and TSH do as far as what the blood levels and the brain levels of T4 and T3 are, but it's actually in those cells as well where T3 is acting and acting in a way that it impacts peripheral metabolism. So on the right, where there's this little picture of a skinny mouse and a less skinny mouse, an overweight mouse, this is a mouse model where they, they created a mouse model where T3 did not act at the nucleus. So they had T3 resistance, TR beta is a nuclear receptor for thyroid hormone. And when you knock out the ability of T3 to act within the hypothalam hypothalamic area that controls appetite and controls the sympathetic tone to a lot that it controls metabolism, a mouse will end up being overweight. And so just damage to the hypothalamus within the thyroid axis of the hypothalamus can increase the likelihood of gaining weight. That happens probably for two different reasons. There's a peripheral reason why, like in the rest of our body, and a central reason why, I just went over the central part. Peripherally though, there seems to be an alteration in two different types of fat cells. There's brown adipose tissue and thermogenesis is disrupted. How well that, those, that fat cells burn energy, burn calories is disrupted, so they, they're less efficient at it. Um, and also the conversion from white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. So brown is burning more energy than white to help us keep warm, and then you're using more calories to do that. And when you knock out the hypothalamic region where thyroid hormone works, and it's T3, as I said, not T4, you alter the peripheral metabolism and you have an increased likelihood of gaining weight. So within hypothalamic obesity, as we all know, one pill is not gonna fix this. One activity is not gonna fix it, whether it's, whether it's diet, whether it's physical activity, and there's been many meds. This is just a table from a review article last year, looking at what's been tried to help patients with hypothalamic obesity improve their metabolism and, and decrease the, the obesity. Within that, on the second page, this is all the same table, there have been some studies looking at superphysiologic treatment with T3. So there's some patients that don't convert T4 to T3 adequately, and just the mere fact of having a cranial or some other central nervous system uh, tumor and or the treatment can alter, even if you could make T3, the ability for T3 to control peripheral metabolism. 
If you look at this, neither the one of these studies said that there was some weight reduction using higher doses of T3, but that was four patients. And then there was one patient that said there was no weight reduction, one study that showed no weight reduction and no alteration using PET CT scans and brown adipose tissue uh, metabolism. But that was one patient. So now we have two studies, five patients, four of the five saying maybe it will work, and one of the five saying it may not work. And I think the summary is we haven't adequately studied this, but there is a reason that potentially we should. So what is the best thyroid hormone replacement? So there are guidelines, of course, to help dictate this. I was fortunate enough to work on the one from the American Thyroid Association. It's now seven years old, which is hard to believe. Um, but we defined how do we use thyroid hormone. And in that, we defined monotherapy is the best choice. And people can consider combined therapy, but should stay away from desiccated. And that's what was discussed in 2017. As far as pediatric specific, there are some pediatric specific guidelines for how to treat patients that have survived CNF tumors. And it's not only thyroid hormone, but it's gonadotropins for puberty and growth hormone. And within that, the Chuck Spar from Memorial Sloan was the lead author. There are um, also recommendations, but again, it's T4 monotherapy. Within adults, there's a number of studies now looking at, and you can see the dates, this is all the way back to 1999, but over the years, a lot of trials showing how well combined therapy works, lots of editorials and review articles, and more and more now over the last couple years, over the last one to two years. They've looked at an adult's quality of life and mood, two out of 13 that have showed improvement. They've looked at neurocognitive function, two out of 10 that have shown improvement. But in pediatrics, there are none. We've, we've not looked at this in pediatrics, and we should. What we did last year, last summer, actually, was to say, well, let's look at some of our patients at, at our institute, and if we put people on T4 adequate, T4 only therapy, and we push their T4 elevated, like I said earlier, what happens to their T3? And it's not surprising. The same thing happens in pediatric patients as in adult patients. T4 monotherapy itself, some patients, many patients do fine. Some patients do not, many patients do not achieve a normal T3 level. So they have a high free T4, and they're either at the low end of the normal range or even below it for their T3 levels. And it happens in pediatrics just like it does in adults. So the best treatment, T4 monotherapy, and you target a normal T4 if it's centrally or T4 and TSA if it's peripherally, I think it's critical and I always measure T3 just because I wanna know what the T3 is and potentially identify patients that might benefit from combined therapy. Generic versus brand name, you can talk to your endocrinologist. As I mentioned, I told you the differences. It's a very highly prescribed medicine. So most pharmacies will have a supply chain that's pretty, pretty stable, I would, I, I hesitate to say that right now because our supply chain for almost everything is not stable. Um, but the color, these are color-coded tablets. So the color code should stay the same irrespective of manufacturer, but sometimes the shape changes and that's how you can tell or the markings on the tablet if the manufacturer potentially changed. There's tablets and that's the most that is typically used. There's gel caps, which I didn't mention. And there's actually now a solution that's FDA approved and it comes in single dose files and it's stable at room temperature. So for patients that don't handle tablets, there actually is an FDA approved solution, but do not use compounded suspensions of thyroid hormone. They are not stable over the short term and not stable over the long term, but there is an FDA approved solution. When do we use T3? While patients have persistent signs and symptoms, they're on medium to high dose, you know, full replacement levothyroxine. And I usually check their T3 levels, although there's some argument to say, well, even if they have a normal T3, they're having signs and symptoms, as long as you adequately prescribe T3 so you're not over-treating, there's really no risk to using it. You just have to measure TSH, T4, T3 and keep things stable. But I measure T3 just to know. So how do you get to increasing your T3? Well, you can push the T4 dose up. Typically when that happens, you suppress the TSH. And as we already went over, even with that, you're not gonna normalize the T3. So the only way to really get an increase in your T3 is to use combined therapy. The two options for combined therapy are desiccated, which we've known and used since the early 20th century, and that's the desiccated form, but there are tablets for T3, and I'll just quickly go over why one might be better than the next. This series of graphs just highlights one particularly important thing. So I said T4 has a long half-life, five to seven days. That's true, 
T3 does not, it's in hours. So this is just showing hours at the bottom on the horizontal portion of the graph. If you take T3, you get a peak and then it comes back down. So it's not an adequate once a day medicine. T3 is best prescribed two to three times a day and that's why people don't like using T3. It's obviously easier to take one pill once a day than it is to take something two to three times a day. But for the patients that don't feel better on it, it is something that should be considered. And typically it's, we start with twice a day just to try to avoid the three times a day, which is even harder. So if you use a bigger dose once a day, all you're doing is pushing the peak up higher and it's still gonna come down. So you really do need to prescribe T3 more than once a day. And that's the problem with desiccated. It has more T3 than a person has. And then you'd have to chop up the desiccated form to be twice a day. And you may even have to add T4 into that because you can't adequately get all the numbers um, as normalized as you could if you separated the T4 and T3 and adjusted those two levels differently using synthetic T4 and T3. These are the different forms. There's one that's from Europe and Canada of, of desiccated thyroid that are available. They're FDA approved. They're just not res regulated as synthetic uh, thyroid hormone replacement. And so you can't easily separate just desiccated into both. If you add T3, this is how we typically do it. You do about a 12 and a half to 25 microgram per day reduction in your T4, and then you add in T3 starting at you know, a 13 to 20 to one ratio. So typically it'd be five micrograms and you might split that to one half, you know, half a tablet twice a day. And then you can go up from there to try to get the T3 into the mid portion of the range and see if patients feel better. How about from hypothalamic obesity? When would we consider um, T3 therapy? Well, as we said, T4 is not um, adequate and there is reason centrally for patients with CNS tumors and hypothalamic obesity to think that T3 actually might be beneficial. Um, and there's only been, as I mentioned, two studies with five patients. It'd be even more interesting, and I think if we're gonna do a prospective study, we need to think about also checking the genetic SNP that's associated with a decreased ability to convert T4 to T3. And that may be a clinical marker to help identify which patients with CNS tumors and hypothalamic obesity are at risk of having altered T4 to T3 conversion, not just peripherally, those are, that's what we measure in our bloodstream, but also centrally in the, in the hypothalamus, and maybe that help select which patients of the patients with hypothalamic obesity would be even more likely to benefit from combined therapy. So we really do need to relook at this and think about when and if and who we could use combined therapy to see if there really is a beneficial um, effect for patients with hypothalamic obesity. To close things out, and then we'll be happy to take questions, there are things that are happening that are also exciting and new in the land of thyroid. So if you can't produce adequate thyroid hormone, there's now an ability to take a stem cell and convert it into a thyroid cell and have it function. And so far, it's proven effective in mice. And I bet you in our lifetime, this may be a therapy that would be effective in a person. And anytime you can replace something um, through this type of mechanism, it's you're more likely to have no levels that would be more um, recapitulating what normal healthy state of the axis would be. So they take stem cells, they, they put them in a culture and they turn them into thyroid cells and they can inject them into a mouse, hopefully a person someday, and they will replace your thyroid, not just with a pill, but actually tissue that's working in under regulation. And they're also thyromimetics. They, they look like thyroid hormone, they're a metabolite, um, and they actually might be effective also for treating hypothalamic obesity. The last thing I'll say is if you or your patients, I mean, you or your kids or your family members had radiotherapy of the head and neck, the thyroid gland is highly radiosensitive and you always have to think about it. Radio radioactive induced thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Um, these are things that we typically start following within five years after exposure. There's a big risk um, for developing these. So the earlier you catch it, the like, higher le the likelihood is that the treatment will be less intensive. So the younger you are at the time of exposure, particularly under age 10, the shorter the latency and the higher the likelihood of developing radiotherapy-induced thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. So with that, I will end. And I think there's at least one question. Um, and um, I think we have 10 minutes to go through questions. So I'll end there. And I don't know if you're gonna be unmuted or how we're gonna answer questions, but I'm happy to answer them. So thank you for your time. Um, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation.
Thank you. Um, so the one question came from Nicole Hughes. Is there a the 30 to 60 minute food window with a T3 replacement? A great question and not adequately studied. Um, so it has a shorter half-life. What we tell our patients is try to follow the same um, pattern. So 30 to 60 minutes is, I usually don't tell our patients that because it's so disruptive to daily schedules. I usually say 15 to 20 minutes, um, but certainly if you have the time, that's great if you can do 30 to 60 minutes. Hi, Andy, it's Shana. While we wait for other folks to put their questions in or speak up, I wanted to thank you for that for that talk. It's, it was fantastic. And it makes me think I don't often these days, and I'm guessing this is true in our division, like pursue the, you know, I, the T4, T3 com combined therapy um, as often as maybe I should think about. I know there's like the adult practice is, is doing that more and more these days. For folks on this call or others who are curious about talking with their endocrinologist about it, like what advice might you have? You gave us a little bit about like one approach that you could do, like starting of course with checking the T3, but could you speak a little bit more if folks, if folks wanna take this idea back? Sure. Um, so in, in training and I'm, I'm about you, Shana, but my mentors kind of talked about it as quackery. Like, why would you think about combined therapy? T4 is the greatest thing ever. Uh, it's one pill once a day and it fixes everything and it has a long half-life and it's stable and it's awesome. Um, so, but it is being discussed. It's just probably a harder discussion for a pediatric endocrinologist than it is for an adult. It's just not as described in pediatrics. So you just have to bring it up and ask if they've ever measured a T3. And if they haven't measured a T3, ask them to measure a T3. The reality is that can be helpful, but some patients still have symptoms and their T3 is still in the normal range. And still, you, then you just have to try to have a, you know, a, a conversation because our job as physicians is to educate and to listen <laughs> that we can try something different and there really is no risk to it. So as long as you target to have normalization of numbers, um, you're not putting your patient at risk and at decreasing the T4 a little bit and adding T3, there's really no risk to it. You watch the TSH and in our patients though with cranios and CNS tumors, the TSH isn't even helpful because they don't produce adequate. So all you have to really follow is the T3, T4, and then you can follow just peripherally, like what's their heart rate and other things that help give you some sense, like are you over treating? Because that's what you want to avoid. Um, and if that person's not open to those discussions, and you have someone else that you can go talk to, then that's the time you think you think about a second opinion because we should all be as, as physicians providers open to pay our you know questions from our patients. So the, the only other thing that I hear from patients is, you know, desiccated is better because it's all organic and we've all gone to the all organic route. And hopefully what I convey to you, it's really not better because it's organic. This is better for some patients, they feel better because it's combined therapy. So I have some patients on desiccated. They either came to me on desiccated or they insisted on being on desiccated. And all I do is educate them and say, here's the plus minuses. And as long as we follow numbers, I can work with it. It's not, no one's out in the backyard making desiccated thyroid. It's produced by companies. Companies are you know, inspected by the FDA. They're just not as regulated as the other drugs. Um, and that's also a safe form of thyroid hormone replacement, despite what I think our mentors, I don't know about your mentors, at least what my mentors kind of taught us during our training, you know, 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm glad we have an opportunity to revisit. This, this is going to make me think more. I'm glad I joined you. I knew I knew I was going to, yeah. I knew I was going to ex expand a little bit thinking about that. You have two more in the chat. Yeah. Andy. So does puberty or the fluctuation of growth hormone impact the levels of thyroid? During this time, my son's thyroid was very inconsistent. Um, yeah, they're kind of two different questions. So they can, during puberty, there are alterations in the, in the axis. What we, at least what I think about, and Shana can also um, provide feedback. When we look at growth hormone testing, thyroid hormone really is important to make sure it's normal because it, that has a great impact on linear growth and progressing through puberty. So you always want to make sure T3, T4 are normal or T4, I keep bringing up T3 because that's my practice, but T4 is normal before you test for growth hormone deficiency. Um, 
and before you initiate and even after initiation of growth hormone therapy. So there are some patients that have a normal T4, you start growth hormone therapy, and for whatever the reason, I don't know the explanation, maybe Shana does, the T4, the tone of the, T, the thyroid axis decreases and all of a sudden they need T4 added even after they started growth hormone despite having normal prior. So we absolutely follow it. It has an impact. If you have hypo or hyper, it can impact the pace, the onset of puberty. If you have growth hormone deficiency, it impacts testing and it impacts effective therapy. Um, and you really need to follow the T4 before testing and even after initiation of therapy to make sure it stays normal and replace if it doesn't. Fair, Shana, or anything else? <laughs> no, I agree. I think that's awesome. I think you you probably have time for one. Yep, I don't one know more. if we have another one, but there's another good. one in there too. Uh, my son's dose was slightly increased in hopes to give him more energy to manage his busy recovery and school schedule. Yep. We aren't sure after. We aren't sure after being on the new increased dose for about three weeks that there's a steady uptick in energy. He suggests we keep pushing the dose levels provided. Yeah, that's a great question and a really hard situation. Um, so within three weeks, you can see the T3 and T4 levels come up. We typically wait four to six weeks, really not because of the T3, T4 levels, but because of the TSH. So if your son has central hypothyroidism, three weeks is kind of the onset of, are you getting any impact on the dose change? The things that may confound your ability to interpret that is one, if you've been out of energy for many weeks or months, and then you normalize T3, T4, you're not gonna fix that in three weeks. There's always gonna be a double, triple recovery time, even within that dose increase for T4. So that's one thing, three weeks is kind of the first look, but waiting a little bit longer, um, maybe you might be able to get a better sense of if there's been any change. The other issue of course is, you know, depends how old your son is, but most kids, even without CNS tumors, will have a terrible sleep hygiene schedule these days. Um, so sleep hygiene is critically important. And if they have an altered daytime, nighttime, sleep cycle just because of the CNS tumor and, and the treatment that already, that complicates things even more, but trying to maintain sleep hygiene, even thinking about going to a sleep center is really critical for fatigue and also for calorie metabolism. And then the third part of all that is all the zillion other things that make us tired. So I don't know how your son is, but our kids are way overstressed and worked than I was during high school, or maybe they, they just didn't pay as much attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> but their expect the expectations are much higher. So they have a lot of stress. And so it's just really important to try to look at all those other things and also behavioral health and try to tie the 10 different or 20 different things that are associated with fatigue. Um, some of which we don't have control over and some of which we really do have some control over. And if during all that time, the T3, T4 are still kind of low or mid range, and the, and the heart rate's okay, because if TSH isn't measurable, if it's central hypothyroidism, then you can increase the T4, T3 dose. You just have to make sure you're not inducing increased heart rate, like tachycardia, um, and then you're not inducing anxiousness. That's another kind of side effect. If you're becoming more anxious, it might be another indicator that your T3 and, your, and or your T4 levels are too high. So the, the simple answer is yes, you can increase the dose. Um, you just have to know what to look for if TSH isn't part of that because of its centrally, uh, the cause is central, 16 years old. Yeah, and that's just a really hard age. And then you throw in the last year and a half on top of all that. And it's just been really difficult. But there, there is a reason to, to try to fine tune T3, T4. It's not gonna be the, the title of my talk suggests one pill isn't gonna fix this, but it certainly can be a piece of a multi you know, attack process to try to decrease the fatigue. Any others? I didn't see any others. I don't think so. That, it looks like that's all the questions. All right, if there's some after, because I know there's more to the meeting, I'm always happy. Shana knows where to find me, to track me down. <laughs> I'm always happy to try to answer questions. Um, so I wish you guys all the best. And again, thank you for the invitation. Stay well and have a great holiday season. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks everyone for joining.